Hello, my name is Andy Michael. I'm a professor of field crop entomology at the Ohio State University. The topic today is Bt resistance in insects. For a long time, most growers have been using transgenic or GMO corn to control against insect pests. This includes above ground, which are caterpillars that feed on most of the ears and the silks, and even below ground, which includes most of the corn rootworm species. We've had these technologies for about 20 years for above ground and maybe about 15 years for below ground. Because we've been using these for a long time, naturally insect resistance is occurring. We've seen insect resistance occur in below ground, specifically western corn rootworm, to most of the traits that are available to control this pest. Fortunately for Ohio, we have not seen any evidence of resistance, but it's becoming a huge problem out west in Iowa, Nebraska, and other locations. One of the other major concerns that we have for Ohio, though, is Bt resistance in some of our above ground pests. These include many of the Lepidopteran or caterpillar species that we see feeding on pollen, silks, and the ear, especially the kernels. One historical pest used to be European corn borer, which is usually controlled for a long time. However, in the past few years, we've detected resistance in Nova Scotia, and the concern is that this resistance in European corn borer is gonna be spreading to Ohio. More concerning for Ohio are two pests named Western bean cutworm and corn earworm. Western bean cutworm has been in Ohio since around 2006, most, uh, most often found in the northern half of Ohio. This pest is now resistant to Cry1F. Only the trait of VIP3A or Viptera will now control Western bean cutworm and it's becoming a huge problem. Another major issue is corn earworm. This has not historically been a big problem for Ohio, most likely found in sweet corn, but it's starting to go into some of our field corn as well. This pest is now resistant to certain Bt traits, and we have found fields, several fields in Ohio, where control has failed against corn earworm. In the past, we've planted separate refuge populations. These are areas of corn that do not have Bt, but now these refuge corn are integrated into the whole field. So in this field here, we have a mix of corn planted with Cry1F as well as certain refuge. Now we cannot determine whether or not uh, corn is a refuge or a, or a BT ear, but today we can use a demonstration, or I'll show you a demonstration using a test strip to identify which corn is BT and which one isn't. This is important because now that we have resistance, we are uh, urging and recommending growers of above ground protection in Ohio to scout and inspect their field for insect damage and monitor for any presence of resistance. If you see feeding on what might be a BT field, that doesn't necessarily mean you have resistance. That feeding could occur simply on a refuge ear. But if you have a tense feeding, more so than five or 10% of your field, that might indicate you have a resistance issue and it's really imperative to go in and check the corn. So if you've identified feeding on ears or on, on, on corn leaves and you think you might have a resistance uh, issue, the first thing to do is take some samples of your field of individual corn plants and run a BT uh, test. The easiest way to do that is to purchase these um, quick strip tests. There's a company called Envirologics that supplies these and they come in a tube like this and it's a strip, simple strip test that will determine whether or not a particular corn plant is expressing BT or not. So when you purchase a kit, a couple elements are going to come with it. You'll get a, a, a container filled with buffer and you can fill that buffer into this little eyedropper here. You'll get a package of test tubes, plastic test tubes that you'll use to grind your tissue sample in. You'll get a package of pestles and these pestles help you grind the tissue. And then of course you get your strip test, which you use to determine whether or not a particular corn plant is expressing the Bt protein. So you can use any type of tissue you have in the corn, uh, roots, uh, uh, stalks, husks. So here I've just got some leaf material and you can put this in a test tube here, take a pestle, and just shove that down for now. Here's another test, a uh, corn tissue sample. Roll it up. These do not have to be big, uh, just you know, any small size, enough to fit this test tube, and then smash it down. And here, we'll test some corn silks. The protein is meant to be expressed in all corn tissues. Um, and so the test itself is, is meant to detect the Bt protein 
and any of the corn tissue. So again, just smash it down. Once you have the material smashed down, take your eyedropper and just really all you need is one or two drops in each tube. Just enough to kind of get the material wet. And then take your pestle and grind. You want to grind until there's a slight discoloration of the liquid. So in this case, you get a little bit of the green. There's some relief material. Just keep grinding. Once it turns green, you know you've done a lot. You don't need to completely homogenize the sample until there's nothing left. Just until you get a slight discoloration in the buffer. Once you do that, these strip tests are meant for one individual sample, and there's arrows on the bottom here. Um, and then on the top here, it tells you what particular protein you're going to be testing for. So in this case, we're testing for Cry1F, which is a particular above ground uh, protein. Make sure you buy the right test uh, strips for your product that's in your field. And you can check this by looking at the BT, uh, handy BT trait table uh, available online. So with the arrow down, put that into the liquid. And what's going to happen is the liquid is going to kind of wick up this strip and give you um, either two bands or one band. And so we'll do that for all the samples. So after you put the strip in the liquid, usually wait maybe two, three minutes or so, and the buffer will take the material up through the strip test. And you can see here that you get two possible results. Um, you have either two lines or one line here, a uh, purple line. If you have the one line, the line on the top, that means that the test is working. This is a positive control. So you know the test is working. And in this particular sample here, I only see one band. That, um, that means that there's no Cry1F protein in here. So this particular corn plant did not express the protein. In this case, I see two bands. The top one is a positive control. You should always see that. And if you see a lower band, that indicates that this particular sample was expressing the protein. Here is our silk sample, and you can see here as well that we have two bands, and this shows that the silk is actually also expressed in the BT protein, which is good if you're a caterpillar and feeding on the silk, that means you should be killed, unless of course you are resistant. But these tests do a good job of making sure that if you see damage on corn that you think is BT or in a BT field, run these tests to ensure that the damage is actually on a plant expressing a BT. If the damage is on that plant that is expressing BT, you may have a resistance situation. If you do have resistance issues, contact your local extension educator or contact myself, Andy Michael, M-I-C-H-E-L dot seven zero at osu.edu.